Well, welcome, family. This is Bishop S. Smith for Wednesday Noon Bible Study. And today we have a special guest, uh, one of our good family friends, Zoe, a member Henry Dobson, and he's going to be sharing about his um, cancer battle, and it was a battle, and, uh, and also how he's recovered and healed and really moving forward uh, with his life. And now he'll share more about how he's helping others to be encouraged when they face similar kind of crisis. And so I'll open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into our interview. We'll give you an opportunity toward the end if you have some questions, uh, so you can be, be very specific. Uh, we don't want to have a big story and background if you have a question. That's not uh, fair to other people who have a very specific question, uh, or we can put it in the chat. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to you. We pray, Father, that you will continue to minister the word of truth to your people. Thank you for giving us, me and my dear friend, Henry, the tongue of the learner, that we know how to speak a word in season to them that are weary, and that our speech and our teaching and preaching is not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but with demonstration and manifestation of the spirit and of power. Therefore, Lord, we commit to give you alone all the praise and the glory and the honor for what will take place today and also in the many days to come. In the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. Well, welcome, Henry. We appreciate it. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Bishop. And I would like to begin with uh, maybe give us a, a brief, uh, short overview, if you would, of your journey when you first got sick and then when you kind of got to the hospital and what kind of happened there. Give us a sense of uh, what was going mm -hmm. on and, and that kind of uh, adventure for you. Okay. Um, well, briefly, the, the overview is um, I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which is a form of bone cancer, in July of 2015. And prior to that, I had never really been very sick in my life. I hadn't really had any serious illnesses. And so I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma because of a, a, a visit to my family doctor for a different issue. I had pulled some muscles in my back. And <clears throat> once um, she thought that it was, she had a, a uh, she thought it was multiple myeloma, but she's not an oncologist. So she referred me to uh, City of Hope, but I eventually wound up going to Cancer Treatment Centers of America in Chicago for the actual diagnosis because City of Hope didn't have room None of their oncologists did. And so I wound up in uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America in Chicago. And that was uh, and supposed to be a six day evaluation turned into a 33 day hospital stay. And then I came back after that um, to um, California. And at that time, City of Hope then had an opening. And so I came back in uh, the end of August, beginning of September. And from September to uh, from September on until eventually November of 2016, I um, received my healing, the remainder of my healing at City of Hope. So I understand the uh, airplane journey was pretty uh, challenging. Comment about that. Yes. Yeah, so I didn't really have any symptoms of multiple myeloma. I just had pulled the muscles in my back because I was trying to help a friend move some belongings from a uh, public storage uh, center in downtown LA to Costa Mesa. And so while I was trying to help, I had pulled, severely pulled the muscles in my lower back. So that was really my only symptom that I had. And that really in and of itself was not a multiple myeloma symptom. But as time went on, I started feeling worse and worse. And ultimately, it got to the point where I was really struggling when it came time to actually fly to uh, Chicago for treatment. So uh, while I was at the airport, uh, Vanessa had gone ahead through the security, and she just wanted to make sure that we were going to uh, get on the plane in time. And of course, we were a little late because we were late, as we sometimes are. So she just went ahead and she only thing she left for me was a little bag, little carry-on bag to uh, take on the plane. So it had to go through the uh, through the X-ray machine. And then uh, when I got to the end of the X-ray machine, I it, the bag actually fell on the floor. So I had to bend over to pick it up. 
And when I bent over to pick it up, I felt this excruciating pain in my back. And it was so bad that they actually had to get a wheelchair for me. I, wow. I, I could hardly get up. And so uh, Vanessa, in the meantime, she had gone to the gate and she was wondering what was taking me so long. And of course, you've been to LAX. It happened that the gate that we were at, we're at the very end of the, the line. You know how you have the gates as you leave? And they tell me, of course, it was the last one. So she was way down there. I was in, in trouble. So finally, uh, she couldn't find me when she came back. And ultimately, she found me in this wheelchair. She said, well, what's wrong? I said, oh, my back is really hurting. So she was running with me in the wheelchair and telling me, hold on, hold on. So we're trying to get to the gate. We get in the gate and I, I, I make it to the, the flight. And all during the flight, it's about a three hour flight. It got progressively, I felt progressively worse, tired, just worse. And so by the time I got to the airport, um, the Cancer Treatment Centers of America had a limousine waiting to pick up patients that come to their facility. And so yeah, if you've ever been, it was a long stretch limo. So if you've ever been in one of those, you know they're pretty low. You get in them, you gotta step down to get into them. I had so much trouble just trying to bend down to get into that thing. It was very painful, and I, I, but I did manage to get in. And then the driver said, it's a 40 minute drive to the facility. So I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is gonna take a while. But when we finally got to the, the hotel where we were going to stay, I was in so much pain that the limo driver had to help me out of the limo and he had to carry, uh, he had to walk with me to the restroom and he had to hold me up while I used the urinal because I couldn't, I didn't have any more strength. He just had to hold me up. And then we finally got into the room and um, I was really feeling bad. This mostly aching and pain. It wasn't anything specific. Just I just hurt and I was tired. And when I looked at the bed, I realized if I laid out in that bed, I'm not getting up in the morning. Our, my our appointment was the next day. I said, there's no way I'm going to be able to get up out of that bed as bad as I'm feeling in the morning. So what I wound up doing was I wound up sleeping in the recliner in the room. I just kind of reclined it. And it was a very, it was a very fitful night. So that was my, my trip to Chicago, to Cancer Treatment Centers of America. That's good. Uh, so I'm curious, did you alert any people? Uh, obviously, prayer played a very important role in your uh, progress. But at that stage, were there anybody that you prayed or talked to you, yourself and your wife about praying for you while you're traveling? Well, um, at that point, we hadn't really. Vanessa had sent out one prayer uh, request. I think she just talked to and she talked to my she sent a text to my brother. Because at that time, we still didn't know that I had multiple myeloma or not. We just knew I needed to go find out. So we were there to find out. So not really at that point did we really have the, the prayers going. We just said, I think she told my brother, we arrived safely and uh, just, you know, pray for us. We're going to we're going to go see what happens in the morning or something like that. So once you got the uh, basic diagnosis, uh, or some of the and go through the process. Uh, and you can always, you know, back it up if you need to. But what was your most encouraging thinking that you began to experience, or and or discouraging thinking in your mind? Uh, to share with us, well, because just as you know, when challenges come, the way we think and the thoughts we entertain can be very challenging. Well, the first time I had any inkling of it, of course, was with my family doctor, because um, when she looked at the, uh, she decided that uh, she wanted to take some X-rays even though it was just a pulled, pulled muscles that I, I came to see her for. And she just by chance, as a matter of course, said, well, let's just take some x-rays and see what else, if anything else is going on. And when she did, that's when she saw something that she said didn't look right. Something, something just doesn't look right. So that started me on a series of, of additional tests that she would send me on. And every time she got the lab results, she would, or the test results, she would send me on another test. She would never say what it was. She just kept sending me on these tests. Mm -hmm. And so we got tired of being sent on tests with no results and, and my back was progressively getting worse. So ultimately we just had an appointment. We scheduled an appointment with her and just said, um, can you just tell us why we're going through all of this? And, and that's when she told me 
that she thought it was multiple myeloma. And I had never heard of multiple myeloma. I, I didn't know anything about it. O only thing I knew was that anything ending in OMA probably isn't good. So that was all I knew. Okay, well, multiple myeloma, what's that? And she finally said, well, I think you have bone cancer. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that I'd heard the word cancer. And so that was a that was a bit of a shock. I didn't think anything, I had no clue because I didn't have any other symptoms other than the pulled muscles in my back. And so when she said that, it was um, it was as if time sort of stood still. And you know, if you've ever been in an automobile accident, if you in a crash, you can kind of see things moving in slow motion. That's kind of where I felt like time had just sort of stretched out. And it was only about a minute maybe that I was I sat there. But when I did, um, all of these thoughts came rushing to my head. And the main one was it was a collection of all of these sermons that I had heard uh, over the years from different pastors and different churches. And the sermon basically came down to uh, the question, well, what are you going to do when you get that report from the doctor that you're not expecting? You know, what are wow. you going to do? How are you going to react? Are you going to um, get angry? Are you going to be upset? Are you going to cry? What are you going to do? Or are you going to trust in God? What are you going to do? And my mind said, you're going through a moment like that right now. <laughs> and wow, here I am in the midst of this and I'm going through that. So um, I decided that, and I had thought about this a long time ago, that if I ever got any of this type of news, I certainly would not get angry. And I certainly wouldn't say, why me? And the reason why is because um, the Bible says that it rains on the just and the unjust. So the real question is not, why me? The real question is, why not me? You know, what makes me so special that I wouldn't experience some troubles and difficulties in my life? So I didn't get too upset, but I asked the doctor, well, you know, how do we, uh, how sure are you? And she said, I'm about 75% sure. And I said, well, what does it take to get 100% sure? And she said, well, you really need to go see an oncologist. And I said, well, how do we go to see an oncologist? And she said, well, I'm going to um, make a referral to the City of Hope, and we'll see what happens there. And she did, and the next day is when we found out that they didn't have any room at City of Hope. And so I wound up having to go to Cancer Treatment Centers of America. So I guess the first thing that came over me was really more just trusting that, you know, this is something that God is going to have to deal with because if you first hear that you get some bad news, particularly cancer, one of the, the first thing that came to my mind was, Henry, you are not in control. So I immediately I knew that there was nothing I could do. I, I'm not a doctor. I don't know anything about this disease, this type of cancer. Even if I did, there's nothing I can do. I knew I was not in control. But what gave me peace and what gave me comfort was I knew who was. And I knew that God was in control. And so I said, well, you know, if God's in control then everything's going to be all right. Um, this, this is not a surprise to him. He knew this day was coming. And so he's not shocked like I am that what's going on. He, he already knows that he's handling this. So at that time, I had peace. Um, when I got to Cancer Treatment Centers of America in Chicago, where they took some blood and uh, they looked at the blood and after about an hour or two, they called us in to see the admitting oncologist. And he, that's when I really got the diagnosis. So before that, I was just kind of in a lot of pain and I'm thinking, well, maybe I have it, probably do, but I don't know. But he said, uh, the doctor said, yes, we can confirm that you have multiple myeloma and we know what type it is. We know everything about this. You definitely have multiple myeloma. So once he said that, then I started trying to think about, okay, well, now I have a real diagnosis. Now I can start to you know, figure out what I'm going to do. But before I could finish that thought, he said, but you're a very sick man, Mr. Dodson. And I said, well, what do you mean? I mean, I felt bad. You know, my back hurt and I was tired and all that. So, but, I mean, I didn't really feel sick, sick, like I would imagine I would. He said, 90% of your marrow is cancerous wow. and your kidneys have failed and you are anemic. 
And he said, it's a miracle that you survived the flight from Los Angeles to Chicago. You could have died okay. along the way on any of the side effects that could come about because of this multiple myeloma. And that kind of shocked me. I didn't, because I didn't feel as bad as he said I should, you know, if you're that close, I just didn't feel that bad. I, I was really kind of shocked. And I said, well, it sounds like what you're saying to me, doctor, is I've got one foot in the grave and the next one on the banana peel about ready to slip and fall in. <clears throat> and he, he said, I would never tell a patient that, Mr. Johnson. That's not, that's not, we would never say anything like that. And I said, oh, he said, but you're right. <laughs> and he said, so this is a very aggressive uh, uh, cancer that you have, and we're going to have to treat this aggressively. So instead of doing our six-day evaluation that we were going to do, we're just going to admit you right now. I mean, there's no need to do any evaluating. We know what you have, and we know it's bad. We're just going to admit you right now. And so that wow. was when it really started to sink in. It's like, oh, I'm really sick. You know, oh, this is really bad. But before I could really kind of process it, uh, two hours later, I was in a hospital bed and I was delirious from chemo. So I really didn't have a lot of time to even process it because I was hyped up on the medication just trying to save my life. Wow. Wow. So how now, Vanessa, your wife was with you there as well, correct? Yes. And um, at that time, when you got admitted. Uh, how did your support system and how did she interact and, and how was well, she well what she said was when the doctor said that I you know gave us the diagnosis that 90 percent of my marrow was cancer and all that she just said in her mind she was in shock she said oh not my husband not Henry it's not him this can't be happening to him you know, in her mind she didn't say this but when I asked her later she said I said oh no I can't believe it. not him and so uh she was kind of stunned too and when we got to the room, the, you, know, you have to sign a lot of papers and you've got to make some decisions. And so she was just kind of caught up in all of that. And she, she realized, though, that she was going to have to come up to speed pretty quickly. And she was going to have to spend uh, most of her time being my primary caregiver. And I don't know if anyone here knows what that means, but if you're a primary caregiver of a cancer patient, that means that you are with them all the time when they go to see the doctor, when anything is going on. And typically, if they can't make decisions for themselves, then you have to make those decisions on their behalf. They, they sometimes get the healthcare power of attorney so that you can make decisions. And so she was going to have to do all of that and learn what this was. And at the same time, because we were 2,000 miles away from home, she had no one there that could help. So she had to figure out well, how can I tell people what's going on? But at the same time, how do I uh, how do I take care of what Henry needs? Because I was delirious. I, I could not make decisions for myself. And so what she decided to do was to create a private Facebook group. And um, that's a Facebook group that you join by invitation only. So she sent out this notice and said, I'm creating this Facebook group because Henry has been diagnosed with, with uh, multiple myeloma, a form of cancer. It's pretty bad. So I would like to use this medium to communicate to you what's going on. So that's when the prayer team uh, started. So people started uh, calling, uh, emailing her and adding, asking to be added to the Facebook group. And so she started adding people. And then she started uh, giving daily reports on what my status was and what she wanted them to pray for and also how she was feeling about it. And so that's how it all got started. You know, I think that's an important element to, as you shared for, for our audience to understand that as soon as you got a sense of what you were dealing with, she established uh, and contacted a community, established community that she trusted that would pray. And uh, yeah. just keep them updated and what she's believing God for, which, you know, what, the, what they're dealing with, that's huge. Uh, our experience in our Zoe community, people get connected to a prayer community. Uh, they get that prayer request, and, and people that know how to pray won't just panic and get all, oh, can't believe this right. happened. And go there when you're in battle. Right. So we get people who've seen this kind of thing, crisis before. Uh, yeah, they may not like it, may, may feel a little awkward, but people that know how to pray and, and uh, 
I believe that's been a part, a good part of, uh, of I'm sure you, your book talks about that, a good yeah. part of how God was able to work through, because as you know, we're co-laborers together with God, and it's not just all God, not just all us, we work together. And yeah. you know, we know the enemy behind come to steal, kill, and destroy. We God would have, Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. So to have that and to overcome, uh, oftentimes it takes a fight. So I, I applaud you and your wife for doing it. Well, continue, please. Yeah, so so the the thing though that was um the thing though that was uh more important, the doctor said, is that yes, you have multiple myeloma and yes. 90% of your marrow is cancerous. But the main thing at this point is that your kidneys have failed. Mm -hmm. And the doctor said, if we don't solve the kidney problem, you won't have to worry about multiple myeloma. That will kill you in and of itself. You, don't, you won't live long enough to have to worry about what multiple myeloma will do. And I knew what he was talking about because my mother passed away from kidney failure. Uh, she had uh, she had been on dialysis for about three years, and she just decided at the end that it was just too much for her, and she just decided not to take dialysis anymore. And at that time, uh, we were we were uh, shocked and sad that she had made that decision. And the, but the doctor was talking to us and said, "Well, um, the prognosis for a person whose kidneys have failed and does not take dialysis is." Uh, the longest we've known anyone to survive is 21 days. So once you stop, your body will just give out in 21 days. And so I knew that um, I was my kidneys had already failed. So I was already in the 21 day window. You know, I didn't know where I was in it, but neither did they. And that's why they said, if we don't stop this, it won't really matter what happens with this multiple myeloma. So uh, they started me on hydration. They gave me saline solution. And they were giving me uh, a liter every hour. Wow. And for five days, I was going to the restroom every half hour or so. And I was putting out 250 liters of urine every hour for five days. And one of the reason why my kidneys had failed is because it's one of the side effects of multiple myeloma. Because what multiple myeloma does is it causes the calcium in your bones to, uh, it gets rid of the calcium in your bones. And one of the side effects of that is that you have weak bones and they could break. But when the calcium comes out of your bones, the way that your body gets rid of it is through your urine. And so what happens when you have all this extra calcium now in your blood that's got to get out through your kidneys, um, the calcium blocks the ports on your kidneys. So it's, they get clogged. You can think of a drain, if you will, with a strainer in it. Well, you got all these all these calcium in there, it blocks up the drain so that the blood can't get to the kidneys to be filtered. So it wasn't that my kidneys had any kidney damage. It was that the blood couldn't get through to be filtered. So the, the toxins that your kidneys are supposed to take out of your blood, they remain in your system. And it's those toxins that, that damage your other organs that kills you. That, so in this case, for, for a multiple myeloma. So the approach that they took was to give me hydration. And basically, they were trying to flush the, the calcium out of my system by giving me extra water. So, you know, if you think about a, a clogged drain, if you spray a lot of water in there, it get, gives a chance for some of that clog to float up and maybe some of it can pass through. So after five days, uh, the doctor uh, came in and he, he was pr pretty um, expressive. So he burst through the doors and lifted his hands and said, we saved your kidneys. You know, he was all happy. He was all excited. And he said, you won't ever have to go on dialysis. Your kidneys wow. will be fine. Uh, we were able to flush the calcium out. So everything is good there. So now we just have to worry about the multiple myeloma. That's, <laughs> that's also your next big hurdle. But that was the big one was that um, get your kidneys uh, taken care of. And so that you know, we were going through all of that. And Vanessa was had started by this time putting out these daily posts and letting everybody know. And just to fast forward to the end of the Facebook group, it ultimately wound up having over 225 people mm -hmm. on the Facebook group. And they were in eight different countries and three different continents. So wow. we had people praying everywhere for us all the time. 
And so that was also what helped to lift us up. Now, this is another important point uh, because when you face crisis, sometimes we get embarrassed and, you know, and, you know, she didn't have to put it on Facebook. She could send out emails and so forth. But my point is uh, a private Facebook post, if you know how to do that, helps you be able to get more clear pictures and so forth and everybody can see the same thing. But, uh, uh, but my point is don't be ashamed when you're in crisis, uh, either you or a loved one. Tell people that know how to pray. And so yeah. you know, if you don't know who knows how to pray, that's a problem. So part of this interview is to have people in your life and your spiritual life that you already have a great acquaintance with, maybe already prayed with together from time to time, that they won't just whine and cry and oh, and then call and go on the phone. I got to tell you what's happening. And never pray. Just talk about the talk about the problem. No, develop friends and relationships that will in fact really pray and do their part to help you as well in, in practical ways. So just want to encourage you because this is this is unusual. Can you imagine a person had no community, uh, no prayer community, no faith community. Imagine a person didn't have any good relationships where they had some faith community, but I don't talk to them much, what have you. That's not going to necessarily, necessarily help you as well. And then you don't have a family person, like in this case, it was a wife. You can you imagine if they were estranged? Can you imagine that, you know, he's, he's kind of, you know, she, they've been challenged in their marriage and, she, and she's not interested, uh, or someone else. So think about relationships because you need people to help you, that arise up. Hopefully they love you and they care enough for you to sacrifice of their time and energy uh, to, and do something unexpectedly, take extra time off work and so forth. These are the dynamics I want you to think about because uh, not you need to plan for a crisis, but these kind of things do happen, whether you're the person who helps someone else or uh, you're de dealing with a crisis, you have to fight, you ain't overcome. And so you need a community. We were better together. Okay, go ahead, brother. Yeah, I, I saw a, a question that came up in the chat, which I think I can address right now. And it was, how did we decide to go to uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America, Chicago, as opposed to some other place in California? And this kind of plays into what you just said, Pastor, about having other people in your life. Um, when I was partially diagnosed by my family doctor, and I knew that I was going to have to go to uh, somewhere to get this checked out, to get it confirmed or denied that I had cancer. Uh, the next day, I had a meeting with my colleagues, and it was a, a Zoom meeting. We were on a call. And, and before the meeting got started, I told them, well, I just want to let you all know that um, I probably will not be uh, participating in this meeting because it was a weekly meeting. I said, I probably will not be participating in this meeting um, for the time being because I, there's a possibility that I have cancer and I need to go find out what it's about. And if it's true, then I just won't be here and I'll be busy taking care of that. And that's when a lot of questions came. Well, what's it about? They wanted to know. And I said, well, I really don't know much. All I know is that um, uh, we tried to uh, get in at the local uh, uh, treatment center and there was no uh, room, so we have to figure out where we need to go. And one of the voices on the phone, who was one of my colleagues, she said, well, you need to go to Cancer Treatment Centers of America in Chicago, and you'll get an answer really quick. Wow. And this was a colleague of mine, and actually she's a mentor of mine in my profession. She helped me to do things. And so when she said that, um, I known that she had had uh, stage four ovarian cancer in November of 2014. And when she was diagnosed by her family doctor, she lives in Missouri, he told her, well, you've got three weeks to get your affairs in order and then you're out of here. Mm. And she said, I don't think so. And uh -huh. so she went to Cancer Treatment Centers of America in Chicago. And to fast forward now, she's in remission now. But <laughs> um, the thought in my head was, well, if I have to go someplace that I've never been before, then I want to go where somebody else has gone that got the kind of results that I want to get. So in my mind, it was like, okay, we're going to Cancer Treatment Centers of America in Chicago. And so when I told Vanessa, that's where we wanted, I wanted to go, she said, well, why do we have to go all the way to Chicago? I mean, they've got USC, you've got Cedar sinai you've got, she started naming off all these places. And I told her, 
well, I think in my spirit, I believe God told me that I need to go to Cancer Treatment Centers of America, Chicago. And when I told her that, she got right on board. She said, okay, what do we got to do to get there? There was no questioning it anymore. She said, well, if God told you to go, that's where we're going to go. And so um, just to give you the highlight behind that, my, my colleague that told me that uh, when we had later discussions, she said that when she was little, that she used to uh, live in Mexico and that uh, she was very fluent in Spanish. And as a matter of fact, she was so fluent in Spanish that at the age of seven or eight, it was that they sent her back to the United States because they were afraid she was losing her first language. She'd been there so long. And so I, I asked her, well, what were you doing in, in Mexico <laughs> at such a young age and for so long? And it turns out, she said, well, my father was a full-time missionary. And so we were there because of that. And she said, when I heard that you said that you needed some place to go, she said, God told me to tell you you needed to go to Cancer Treatment Centers of America in Chicago. And she hadn't told me that up to, this was long after, but I felt in my spirit when she said that, that God was telling me, you need to go to Cancer Treatment Centers of America uh, in Chicago to get healed. So it was because, as you said, Pastor Ed, because I spoke up, I didn't keep it to myself, I yeah. just told people what was going on. Then God was able to use them to share with me where I needed to go. And that's where I went. This is powerful because, again, I've been pastoring for a long time, y'all. A lot of people. And sometimes people are just very private and maybe one or two people, which is fine. But we got a crisis. You need more than that. Yeah. You need more than that. And so uh, I want to encourage you. And, and notice that. The Lord, she said, the Lord told me to tell you that. And then when uh, Henry's wife asked him why, about other places you can go in Southern California, I believe the Lord is telling me. That's big. See, you want to witness. Part of the Holy Spirit's role is to witness or to speak truth to us or, or speak the truth to, to us through someone else, a trusted person, a mentor in this case, a person who's overcome cancer. That's an authority. And that they have a, a testimony when she got diagnosed. No, I don't think so. That is the kind of person you want to and have, need to have in your life before there's a crisis. Mm -hmm. Before there's a crisis, you can trust their word. You can trust their witness, what they have in their heart. And so just want to encourage you because a, a life is about relationships, number one with God, but with one another. And that's why it's important forgiveness and, and so forth. I share this because too often Christians, they like islands or they're very limited and, and they don't want to share much. Um, but I just want to share with you that if it, if it happens, if you face a crisis or something even close to a crisis, uh, nothing wrong with asking people to help you pray through the situation. This is good. Right. Continue, please. Uh, so I think we're, we're pretty good. In about uh, 10 minutes, we'll open up for the questions. We don't have any more questions in the chat. Okay. So uh, with, the, with the crisis over that my kidneys um, had been saved, then they got to focus on, okay, well, what are we going to do about this um, multiple myeloma? And so they said, uh, the admitting oncologist had said, you have an aggressive form of multiple myeloma, so we're going to have to treat it aggressively. And again, when you get diagnosed with a disease that you don't know anything about, you really don't know what all these words mean. They just talk. I mean, you just, yeah, I don't know what aggressive means as opposed to not aggressive or, or anything. I just, okay, I'm just doing what you say I have to do. So what the doctor said was, we're going to start you on hyper CVAD. I had no idea what that was. Said, okay, I have no idea what this is. But if that's what they say I've got to do, that's what I did. They said, give me hyper CVAD. And it's, it's interesting because whenever you have any of these especially chemotherapies, these drugs, uh, and, and, and oftentimes the treatments, the procedures that they're going to give you, you have to give your consent. You know, they don't just do this unless they have your permission to do these things to you. And so on the consent forms, it has to, by law, they have to tell you what are all the known side effects that they've seen so that you're fully aware what you're signing up for 
so that you won't be surprised if something happens. And they said, they didn't tell me that. You know, but everything has to be written out. So um, I think I didn't really read it because I was kind of, well, I did read it ahead of time because they hadn't given it to me yet. But when you read the possible known side effects of this stuff, it had everything in it up to and including death. I mean, it was like, <laughs> you could die just from us giving this to you. So I thought it was kind of, <laughs> you are, you know, you're going to sign for this stuff and it could kill you too. But, you know, when you think about, well, what are the consequences? You're going to die anyway. So you might as well take a chance and sign up for this stuff. So I signed up for it. And what I learned later was uh, a hyper C bad. The, the hyper part stood for hyper fractionalization. Mm -hmm. And what that basically means is that um, when they give you the chemo, they give it to you in very, very, very small doses, almost like drop driplets, uh, the droplets of, of, of chemo. Whereas normally when you get an infusion, they give it to you, a, you know, a full dose. And then you have maybe a week or so, or maybe a few days before you come back and get your next dose. Well, with hyperfractionalization, the amount that they give you is so small that they're able to give you chemo continuously. Wow. So I wound up instead of uh, getting a dose of chemo and because typically your, your, your uh, veins can't take the poison going in so strong, it would tear up your, your veins. But with this little fractional pieces that they give into you, you can, it can go in your system. So I was on chemo for five solid days. Wow. Not just usually when you get the chemo uh, treatment, it's usually maybe an hour, maybe a couple of hours, worst case, four hours if you're getting a regular uh, infusion of chemo. But this day I was able to stay on for five solid days of getting chemo. And that's part of the reason why I was delirious because <laughs> I was so hyped up on it. Um, one of the things that happens when you have chemo, uh, you get chemo is a condition called chemo brain. And mm -hmm. what chemo brain is, is that uh, chemo is nothing really more than a poison and it's trying to kill the cancer cells. So it's been specially formulated so that the whatever type of cancer you have, that it has an affinity towards this type of poison. So, but it's poison. So other cells in your body are getting poison too. It's just that the cancer cells have a higher metabolism. So the hope is that you'll kill off the cancer cells faster than you kill off your regular healthy cells. And so, how, which cells get affected, they are dependent on their level of their metabolism. The higher metabolism they have, the more poison they'll absorb, just like the cancer cells. Well, it turns out that in people, your, nerve, your nervous system, your nerve cells have a high metabolism. So as the chemo is killing the cancer, it's also killing your nerve cells. And that's why people who take chemotherapy, they get neuropathy, which is um, people who have diabetes, they're familiar with neuropathy too. They get it for a different reason. Um, when, when you have diabetes, it's because you have sugar in your blood and your blood becomes so thick that when it tries to go through those smaller capillaries and smaller and smaller, it's so thick that the blood can't get through. So their nerve cells die because they're not getting any nourishment because the, the blood is too thick. But the end result is the same. The, the nerves die and you get this neuropathy in your extremities. So that's what happens to me was that I was getting neuropathy. But because it was chemo, it was affecting the nerves in your brain. So your brain cell, you're losing brain cells at a high rate when you're taking this type of chemo. And so much so that um, you can't think straight. And that's what chemo brain is. You can't put thoughts together. Uh, you ramble with your words. Um, there's actually, um, I think there's court cases where they say if a person is taking chemotherapy, that if they sign a, a legal document, a contract or something, they may not be held accountable to it because they may not have been in their right mind, just because the chemo can be that, that strenuous. So I was delirious for, um, <laughs> for quite a while before I even was knew where I was. And so all during that time of delirium, I would fade in and out of, of being lucid, kind of knowing, okay, I'm here. 
And the only thing that I could do at those times was I just, in my mind, I just said, Jesus. That's all I could say was Jesus. In your mind. So as I was going through it, I would just had his name and 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 just kind of tried to get through it until the they stopped giving me this hyper C bad. It was the hyper C bad that made me delirious, plus the hydration that every hour I was going to the bathroom and someone had to help me to get to the bathroom. And you know, it was just it was just those first five days were were a really critical point in in my treatment. Two, two, two things. Uh, this is good. Notice uh, he kept saying Jesus in his mind. Um, for that name of Jesus coming to his mind, it had to be there. It had to be there prominently. He had to be willing to believe. The thoughts come to our minds about all kind of stuff, right? But unless you believe in Jesus, that's that's the key. He's thinking about it. God knows he can't talk. God knows what's going on with him. But he's thinking Jesus. And I've heard testimonies over the years, maybe, maybe many of you. People couldn't talk, they couldn't articulate, but they're able to think it until they get the words out later. So once you understand that God knows what you're dealing with. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, maybe share a little insight. I mean, this is powerful, but I can imagine how expensive this may be. I'm not asking to know how much it costs, but how did you deal with that? Did they say, well, I'm sorry, you came all the way out here, but you don't have insurance or Give a little sense about that, if you would. Well, it's interesting. When we found out about this um, Cancer Treatment Centers of America Chicago, um, we were wondering the same thing. But what we discovered was that they have, Cancer Treatment Centers of America is known internationally for what they do because all they do is cancer. I mean, they don't, they don't do any other, they don't focus on any other illness but cancer. So they are experts at cancer. Whereas, for example, City of Hope, yeah, they do cancer, but they also do diabetes. They do a bunch of other things, but they just do that. And because of that, um, people all over the world want to come there to get treated. And they have benefactors. And it turned out that because of my condition and all of that, I qualify for this six-day evaluation program. And what the six-day evaluation program was, they would... They would fly you to the, the center and they would give you room and board for six days for free. For free. Wow. Did I say that? For free. <laughs> so we had, we did not have to pay. Now, I think they said you had to have insurance, but they didn't charge your insurance. I think once they treated you for those six days, then they would talk about a treatment plan afterwards where you might need your insurance. But those first six days of evaluation, there was no charge. Wow. There was no charge for six days. They, they paid for the flights to and from uh, mm -hmm. the center. They put us up in the, uh, Vanessa, I was in the hospital, but they put Vanessa up for six days in the hotel. They gave her meal vouchers that she could use in the, in the hospital hotel, I maybe mean, in the hospital uh, <laughs> restaurant. I mean, everything was, everything was paid for for those first six days. And then we fortunately, we had insurance that would uh, kick in afterwards, but um, it, was, it was free. And then um, Vanessa started a GoFundMe page. Mm -hmm. Now I, I had some real challenges with that. I, I didn't want people to um, think that we had started this Facebook group just to get money. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how we were, I didn't even know what it was going to cost, but I just didn't want people to think that that was our main intent. But, uh, I, and I struggled with that. I said, I don't want people to think we're just, you know, trying to take advantage of them and financially. But what ultimately happened was God spoke to me and he said that um, some people are going to be blessed by being a blessing. Yeah. And it's not so much about what they give you as much as what they're going to get from me because they've been obedient and they're going to make their, they're going to bless you with some finances to help underwrite some of these uh, costs. And so I said, well, you know, it, it doesn't, it's, it's a little counterintuitive, but in God's economy, it all balances out. So I had to just settle in that people are going to do what they want to do. They're going to interpret it, whichever way they're going to interpret it, either they're going to give or they're not. I don't need to worry about that. I just need to trust God and this will all get taken care of. So that's wow. how some of the financial part, but it is very expensive, very expensive um, just to be in a hospital 
bed for a day. And that's not getting any treatment. That's not seeing any doctors. That's not getting any medication. It's just for occupying the room. And I think all you get there is you get somebody who will come in and take your trash out. That's all. If you just sat there and that's all you did, it's going to cost you $10,000 a day. Wow. So I was there for 33 days. So that's $330,000 just to be in the room. You know, not to mention the medications or the doctor's time or the lab work or anything else. So it's very expensive. Well, I want to say this is powerful and, and uh, I'm glad you shared those details because mm -hmm. um, obviously there are many hospitals probably have funds like that. Um, and this is a specialist hospital. Um, but even if it's a you know, the regular local hospital, I just want to encourage you, number one, is to advocate for yourself. Yes. You know, so get others to advocate who you trust and love and they love you to advocate. And um, but I'm sure a lot of hospitals have a fund that's uh, reserved. I know of a, of a, of a friend of ours working in the MI Project LA, and they provide money and set aside and give it to hospitals for those who can't afford if the operation or the procedure. This fund is available. And so mm -hmm. people that have means, they oftentimes understand that they may have lost a loved one or they want to help somebody with some serious need. And so uh, I share all this to say sometimes doctors are busy and they got a lot of patients and you know, and they're looking at, can you afford, I'm sorry, as opposed to, hold up, is there a fund you got? Mm -hmm. you know, who do I talk to? It's that kind of advocating uh, that we need to do because you're expecting God to come through for you. And he may use a doctor, a nurse, a medical system to help you do that. God can do a miraculous healing, as you know. Right. So fragile, that's work, that work, that's, that's, that's fine too. And let God do what he needs to do. Uh, so give, give a, you know, we're about close to our time, but could you share a bit about this, this journey and in hospital and when you encountered that special nurse? <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> there was a, uh, a time when I was going through some of this chemo. Once they got me off of the, uh, off of the uh, hyper CBAD, then they went to the regular chemo treatments, which was still pretty difficult. And um, I'd have good days and I'd have bad days. Uh, but one, uh, one night, um, they, if you've ever been in a hospital, if you've ever been hospitalized, you know that the nurses, they are on 12 hour shifts. They typically come in, their shift time is seven to seven. So you get this, uh, this and then there's a little overlap when they kind of come in and catch up on what the patients were. Well, this one particular uh, night, it was going to the night shift and a new, a nurse had come in and I had never seen her before because as long as I was there, you know, you get to see all the people come in and do, you know, who's who, you know, their names, you know, you know a lot. I had never seen this nurse before. And wow. uh, what made her stand out was that she was black. So this mm -hmm. was the first black nurse I'd ever seen. So I really kind of said, oh, <laughs> they've got this nurse here. And so Vanessa, typically, she would stay as long as she could in the room with me. And then she'd go back to the hotel. There were a few times when she'd actually stay the night with me, Vanessa. She'd stay in the chair, the reclining chair there. But this particular day, she was tired. She said, I'm going to go back to the hotel. I'm going to rest and I'll see you in the morning. And I was like, okay, okay. And the nurse uh, introduced herself and she said to Vanessa, my name, I don't even remember her name. She said, I'm nurse so-and-so. And, -so, and um, you don't have to worry. I'm going to take care of Mr. Dotson. He'll be uh, just fine. So we'll just see you in the morning. And she's like, okay, I'm going. So she left. Well, late that night, I started, I, I felt like I was under stress and I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I felt like something was happening to me physically. My breathing became a little more difficult. I, I just felt tense and stressed and, and uncomfortable. And so I struggled with it a bit and I said, well, maybe I just calm down or maybe it's just the medication. But no, this was not, this was unrelenting. And so finally, I realized that I was under spiritual attack. And the reason why I was able to recognize it is because I had been under spiritual attack before when I was on a missions trip to South Africa. And I knew what that sensation felt like. So I said, oh, this is, this is a spiritual attack. And so I said, I know what I need to do, because if it's a spiritual battle, 
then it's not mine to fight. This is for me to pray and let God fight this battle. I can pray and he'll bring in all of his legions of angels and everything else. They'll do this fighting. So I just started to pray. I just started praying and I just I know this is all going to work itself out, but it wasn't working. It was still it was still tough. So I figured I needed some help. Again, I needed some help. So I hit the little red buzzer and the nurse comes in in the middle of the night. It's like two in the morning, two thirty in the morning, maybe three. And she says, "Can I help you, Mr. Dodson?" He's all polite, you know. Can I help you, Mr. Dodson? I said, I, "I said I'm I'm not I'm feeling uncomfortable. I know this sounds funny, but I feel like feel like I'm under a spiritual attack. I was just wondering if you could if you could just hold my hand, if you could just pray with me, just just pray with me. I think I'll be all right." This nurse looked at me and she <laughs> said, she shook her head. And she said, Mr. Dotson, <laughs> I told your wife when she left that everything is going to be all right, that you don't, she won't have to worry about a thing. This woman started praying in tongues and she laid her hands on top of me and my body shook. I started shaking. I was vibration. I was shaking as she was speaking over me in tongues and I could feel like a dark, darkness just lifting out of my body it was like it was being drawn out and I was shaking and she was just going on and speaking in tongues and I'm rattling along and and I'm just shaking (laughs) and then when it was all done and my body finally came back to rest she said I told you everything is going to be all right and she left the room and I never saw her again when when Vanessa came in the morning the next day, I was all excited. She said, what's wrong with you? I said, oh, no, you just won't believe what happened. I just went through this whole thing, and I'm all excited. And she was trying to find the nurse. We never saw her again. Ah. So I believe that God sent an angel in the night to look after me and do and speak over my body and to help with that spiritual battle that I had to fight. And it was it was a miracle. It literally was a miracle to have that happen. Well, that sounds like how an enemy will come to steal, kill, and destroy and bring death mm-hmm. during that difficult time. And as the scriptures talk about, be careful how we entertain strangers because uh, we may end up entertaining angels unaware. Right. And so, you, you know, in other words, they look human. Mm-hmm. They look human. And the fact that even though Vanessa saw her, Henry saw her, the nurse, but no one else recognized. We don't know a person like that. You know, never, all, this never praying, saw all this praying, I'm sure some of these people that were praying, including us, I know I was, we were praying in English, we were praying in, in, the, in the spirit as well. And the Bible talks about when you pray, you pray about things you have no mental knowledge of, but you need to pray about what the Holy Spirit prays on your behalf. So yeah. part of that is, is, is the engaging of these prayers that needs to be prayed to God in some cases, to send an angel, to send an angel. And so I just wanted to share with you that all this is the dynamics of prayer and the prayer community and people that are going to not just pray in faith, and pray the word, but pray about specific details or even there's an attack. And you don't know there's going to be an attack. I'm sure when we all get to heaven, we realize how much death and major accidents that we avoided because somebody, if not just you, maybe others as well, prayed for you. Amen. So just want to encourage you that this, this is important, that we're part of a Christian church community that trust believes the Bible. It's not just literature to us. We believe the scriptures. And so, um, so please, I, I don't want to uh, go too far, but I just want to share that with you. Um, we have about uh, six minutes. So why don't we do this? Um, you'll be here next week. And if you're invited to come, mm-hmm. invite your friends and share your friends. And also they can watch this on Facebook. It'll be shared tonight at seven. But I want to encourage you uh, to think about this whole road. And he has a lot more to share. Believe me, a lot more to share. And he has a book. Uh, if you can mention the book on uh, how to get access to it. Uh, Henry? Uh, yes. The name of the book is From Zion to a City of Hope. And the subtitle is A Journey of Faith. And you can get it by going to, uh, I have a website where uh, it's where our books is, is sold. So it's just H b dotson three so h is for henry b for my middle name bernard and then my last name is dotson d-o-t-s-o-n h b dotson three because i'm henry bernard dotson the third so it's h b dotson three dot com c-o-m 
And if you go there, then there'll be uh, a menu item that you can see books or, or, or shop. And if you click on that link, it'll take you to where you can buy the book on, online. And I just quickly, the title of the book came because as I said, um, I went to Cancer Treatment Centers of America, Chicago to be treated, but it turned out I had that 40 minute ride after we got to the airport. And that was because the Cancer Treatment Center is not actually in Chicago. <clears throat> that's the brand name. It's actually in a city that's 40 miles, 40 minute drive north of Chicago, three miles south of the Wisconsin border. And the name of that city is Zion. Come on. And when I did my research on the book, it turned out that the city of Zion was founded in 1900 by a Scottish pastor who had the who had notoriety at the time because he had the spiritual gift of healing. And he said that he had heard a word from God that said that he needed to go and build a city where people could come to be healed by God. And so he created this city called Zion. And if you go there, all the streets there, the street names are biblical character names. And so that's why the book is from Zion. And then when I came back to California, I was able to go to City of Hope. I said from Zion to a City of Hope. And it was a journey of faith. So that's the title of the book. Wow. I love it. I love it. It's a big part of legacy. Uh, yeah. but, uh, and this shows how God is genuinely interested in yeah. people. Uh, in the 1800s, he taught a man to establish the city. And um, I mean, this hospital has helped, I'm sure, the city as well. Many, many people. Many people. And I so much so, I just tie it off and say that ultimately I found out just this year that City of Hope has bought. Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Wow. They bought all this, all the centers that they have around the country. So they are now part of, uh, of City of Hope. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Probably yeah. that excellent example. Well, if you're here today and as you are and watching and you have not yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have a wonderful opportunity to receive him today. This was not hype. You hear a real story. And he's not finished yet. You can get the book. But my friend, you need to receive Christ if you have not received him already because we're going to one day live in eternity, either with God or without. And while we're on the earth, we can live a wonderful life. It may be challenging, but give an example here. We have help, a way to overcome and maximize the possibility, not just for us, but as you hear more from Henry, follow your mission, your purpose to help others. Repeat after me if you'd like to see Christ today. Dear Father God, I come to you just as I am. I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is now my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul and filling me with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, Henry, once again, and all the community. Uh, share this with your friends. Put it, ask them to repost it. You can repost it and share and, and have them, ask them to like it. We want to help people. This is all about helping people. Uh, and people feel, deal with crisis. And we're learning here how to overcome and develop a community and see one in action as wonderful. So be encouraged. And I'll see you next week. Have a nice one. Bye-bye.